Good evening and welcome to another episode of Inspired. I am here with my co-host, Dr. Rachel Matani, and tonight we have the honor of interviewing Dr. Lee Schwartzberg uh, and get really to know him on a personal level. We all know him from the incredible things that he's contributed uh, to the world of oncology, and tonight we get to look behind that white coat. I'd like to say welcome to the show, Dr. Schwartzberg. I'm really excited to have you here. And as usual, the way our um, interview format goes is I will ask some personal questions and Dr. Matani will ask some questions that dive a little deeper into the beginnings of your career. Uh, things that drove decisions, professional decisions you've made, and things that you find have been pivotal to the growth of oncology uh, as a whole. So we're really looking forward to um, getting to know one another on a deeper level. Thank um, you so much, Sarah and Reshma. <laughs> thank you for having me. This is really fun and exciting. I really appreciate being here. Yes, well, thank you so much. And for all purposes tonight, we're just Rachel, Sarah, and Lee. So um, settle in, get comfortable, and let's get the conversation going. So Rachel, if you don't mind, I'm gonna start with kind of the simplest question. Lee, introduce yourself, uh, just so that we have a context of who we're talking to, and then I'd like you to tell us a little bit about growing up. Where did you grow up and um, Maybe we can just start there. Sure, thank you. So I'm Lee Schwartzberg, I'm a medical oncologist, hematologist. Um, <clears throat> I have several uh, titles in terms of my business world. Uh, my personal title is father of uh, two grown daughters who is my best accomplishment. Uh, but beyond that, I have um, I'm the uh, Chief Medical Officer for One Oncology, a, a national uh, network of community oncology practices. I'm the Medical Director at the West Cancer Center, where I've been for many years. Uh, I'm a Professor of Medicine at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, uh, where I served as the Division Chief for seven years during our affiliation period with the university. And I'm um, uh, editor-in-chief of Practice Update Oncology, where I get to work with Rishma on, medi on metastatic breast cancer. And uh, we talk every couple of weeks, which is a highlight. Very cool. And then, Lee, tell me a little bit about where you grew up. So I'm from Brooklyn. Uh, I'm proud Brooklynite. I must say, when I lived in Brooklyn, it didn't have the cachet that it does now. Everybody wanted to go there. I couldn't wait to get out of Brooklyn. And I actually left uh, for college, and I, I really didn't come back afterwards. Uh, I grew up in a, um, in a middle-class family in uh, the middle of Brooklyn, in uh, the Kings Highway area, sort of uh, the Midwood Flatbush Avenue area. And um, the, I went to Madison High School, which was a public high school. And it really was a great high school education for me. Um, it's a very accomplished high school. We have uh, something like four Nobel Prize winners, not me. Um, we have uh, the, um, uh, I think, four senators. Uh, currently, uh, Senator Schumer is one of them. Ruth Bader Ginsburg went there. Um, Carol King went there. Uh, a whole host of people in the humanities and, uh, and uh, in, in sciences and in entertainment. So it was really kind of a crucible when I grew up in the uh, 60s that um, the public high school system in New York was a great system and really sparked my interest in science and, and in art and literature and music. I went to the State University of New York at Buffalo, which um, was uh, a really at that time a, a really excellent uh, university. It was at that time of all the university centers in New York, uh, the, the highlight, the best one. I actually got to um, uh, study while I was in Buffalo with a Nobel Prize winner, uh, Dr. Daniele. He won the Nobel Prize for, he, there were two of them. He was the co-discoverer co of the lipid bilayer, 
of uh, sales. And he was the most unassuming man you would ever meet in your life. You would never think this guy was a Nobel Prize winner. And he used to have us over at his house and it was a really informal sort of a senior level uh, biology kind of discussion course. It was really fun and exciting to, to do that while I was in college. I actually, you know, uh, I'm sorry. No. Uh, um, so I, I was, when I was young, I really was wrestling with, um, with what I would wanted to do with my career. And I always attra was attracted to science. So I was really thinking that I was going to be a scientist. And I actually stayed at Buffalo for a couple of years and got my master's degree in biochemistry. And um, of course, my parents, being the good Jewish parents they were, kept telling me, you should be a doctor, you should be a doctor, you should be a doctor. So I liked uh, being, uh, you know, thinking about being a doctor. And, and after a while, I thought, maybe, maybe that's what I'll do, and maybe I'll do science and uh, be a physician as well. So then I applied to medical school. I actually came back uh, briefly to New York and um, uh, worked in a lab, actually, at New York Medical College doing hematology research, which is where I first actually got excited about hematology and oncology, and then applied to medical school and uh, went to New York Medical College. So that was my that was kind of my early life, but I had a really uh, I had a really good childhood. I really um, I had a very supportive family. I have one brother, and my parents were incredibly supportive to me during my growing up, and I really treasured those years. Um, my parents are still alive. My dad is ninety six, and my mom is ninety one, and uh, she's. He's in a nursing home because he can't walk, but my um, my mom is living independently at 91, and she's uh, she's the same as she always was. Boy, she's got an opinion on everything, so and it's still telling me exactly what to do for everything, you know, like how I should drive and you know what I should do and turn out the lights when I leave the room and stuff like that. So, we what drew you specifically to oncology? So I really. Um, I liked hematology a lot, Rishma. When I did hematology research, I worked for uh, a couple of hematologists, oncologists at the, uh, who were doing research, basic research. I actually started, my first papers were in thalassemia. So that was kind of uh, what I was doing as a lab assistant, essentially, uh, after I got my master's. And then when I went through my rotations, I, you know, like many of us did, uh, I had a professor uh, who really inspired me uh, for oncology uh, on a rotation as, as a senior medical student. And I got very interested in that. I did, so I always liked, and I, and I, I think back now and it's still the same, I always liked high stakes medicine. When I was an intern and resident, I really liked cardiology a lot. And in those days, probably inadvisably um, in the early 80s, uh, the interns and residents could do anything in, and were actually encouraged and given the responsibility to do anything in the ICUs. So when I was in the ICU at uh, North Shore Hospital in Long Island, which was a Cornell program that I, I did part of my training in, the, um, we were in, putting in Swangans catheters in the middle of the night. And uh, that probably wasn't the smartest thing, but it was so exciting to do that and to take care of really critically ill patients. So for a while I was thinking about cardiology, but the other interesting thing, and one of the reasons I went to uh, the North Shore program, the Cornell program was Cornell was affiliated with Sloan Kettering at that time. So you got to rotate and live at, in New York City at uh, Sloan Kettering. So my first year I was there for eight weeks and I met um, people like my first chief resident was Mark Chris, who went on to become uh, the chief of uh, lung cancer at Sloan Kettering and many other uh, very accomplished academic leaders in, uh, in oncology. So that, of course, really stoked my interest in oncology. I think of my fellowship, of my residency class, 
there were seven or eight people who went into oncology. That's how much influence there was because we got to take care of uh, oncology patients and learn from some of the greatest minds who were in oncology at the time. So, um, and I also like living in New York. So they had fellows in residence houses, housing, and my family could live there. And so my second year, I actually stayed longer. And my third year, I stayed the whole year in New York. And then I went to Sloan Kettering as a fellow. So I got in as a fellow at Memorial Sloan Kettering. So I really lived for about uh, four and a half years in New York City in the Sloan Kettering housing and in the Cornell Rockefeller Sloan Kettering community, which was absolutely a fabulous place. Um, I, uh, I had uh, my first, we had our first child when um, I was a senior medical student. So, you know, it was, it was good to have a community for children there and have Rockefeller University for my kids to go to the preschool and the kindergarten. It was, it was really great uh, during the t that time when they were little. Mm -hmm. So there's like a common theme of, um, you know, from your early roots on being surrounded by people that made a mark. And it's so funny to hear you talking about them because I know in other settings, they're talking about you in the same way. You know, that class, out of that class came Lee Schwartzberg, who's gone on to do this and this and this. Um, but I also get a sense of you had a lot of really strong influencers who mentored you moving through different things and helping to make those critical decisions that empowered you uh, to feel not only excited about these high stakes type clinical scenarios, but really looking at the bigger picture differently, which led you down, uh, as we'll get uh, to later in the interview, led you down becoming such an, a significant change agent um, in cancer care. But I do want to ask, how do you go from New York City to Memphis, Tennessee? Yeah, that's um, one of those... Uh things that you learn as you get older in life and as you go through that, you just never know where life is going to take you, right? Uh, you can't, you, life is what happens while you're busy making plans, I think John Lennon said, or it's attributed to him. And I really, I mean, for me, that was really true. Uh, I was a New York kid. Um, I did all my training, New York State. Um, I was planning to actually stay at Memorial. I got offered a position at Memorial. I, I, I should say I, a really interesting year for me was the year of chief residency. So I actually interrupted my fellowship to be the chief resident at, at uh, Memorial for the, for the residents. That's how they worked it there. After you did fellowship for a year, then you could become the chief resident. And that was really interesting because we had the residents from North Shore, my program, as well as the residents from New York Hospital. And the cultures were a little different and it was my task to, uh, to mix them together and have the intern residence team function as units for these six or eight or 10 weeks they were there. So it was a really, really good uh, administrative uh, education for me because I had to meld sort of different cultures and different approaches and people who didn't know each other at all. They weren't, they didn't have that, you know, when you're in internship and residency, it's like you're at, in a sense, like you're at war, you know, your comrades. And these were people getting thrown together in a new situation. So uh, that was, that was, it was a great experience for me. I actually went in, I'm a glutton for punishment, I think it's fair to say. So at, in those years, I, every other night, I had an assistant chief resident who rotated every three months. So every other night I went in to round with the interns at the end of the, in the evening, I went back across the street and I had them present all my cases. That's what we did. They, we presented all the cases to the chief resident or the assistant chief resident every night from the intern. And then the next morning we heard the cases from the residents, the, the junior residents. Um, and so depending on the night, I might spend an hour there. I might spend three hours there if there happened to be a cardiac arrest and a code called and, you know, we'd have to go to the code or if there was a sick patient. So it was a pretty tiring year um, because I would, I, you know, work the whole day and then I'd go back at every other night. So anyway, I, I, I was going to stay at, at Sloan Kettering and, but 
I became close friends with uh, the fellow who lived in the apartment across the hall from me in our, in our housing uh, in a place called Winston House, right across the street from Stone Kettering. And uh, that fellow's name was Kurt Tower, and we started our uh, fellowship together, and we became close friends, and our families became close friends. And Kurt was from Memphis, Tennessee, a place I had never really thought about, uh, except for Elvis. And so um, Kurt was going back to join uh, our, our senior partner, Bill West, who uh, gave his name to, the, uh, to our practice uh, after a while. And I met Bill a couple of times when he came up and visited Kurt. And one Thanksgiving, Kurt invited me down to um, Memphis uh, just for, you know, to, to spend the Thanksgiving with them. And uh, I was still planning to go to Stone Kettering and we went to dinner at Bill West's house and we had a great dinner. And then after dinner, Bill took me into his study and he locked the door and he interviewed me for a job I hadn't applied for. And, uh, you know, one thing led to another. And I said, well, I don't know. I mean, that's, I, you know, I was, Memphis, Tennessee wasn't in my plans. I'm going to be an academic physician at uh, New York. And, um, but one thing led to another. And I think what really, what really uh, convinced me was after Thanksgiving, we were there for the weekend. They said, come on with us, Kurt and Bill. Let's go down to the hospital. We're giving interleukin-2 and lax cells. And I said, what's that? I never heard of that. This was like 1986. And um, we hadn't done that at Sloan Kettering. Kurt Tower and Bill West were doing that in Memphis, Tennessee. They uh, had um, relationships with the company that started it called Cetus. And uh, we gave high dose IL-2 uh, to these really sick patients with melanoma and renal cancer. And three months later, before I made my decision, there was an article in the first two articles in the New England Journal of Medicine. The first one was High Dose Interleukin-2 and Lax Cells by Bolus Infusion by Steve Rosenberg at the NIH. The second article was High Dose IL-2 and Lax Cells by Continuous Infusion by Bill West and Kurt Tower. And when I said, wow, if these guys can publish in the New England Journal of Medicine, that's okay for me. I'll go down there and I'll start a research program. And so that's what I did. What a great story. That's such a great story. So Lee, you know, things have changed, I'm sure, quite a bit as you've uh, gone through your career in, in medicine. I think uh, one of the things that always drew me to a career in medicine is that I get bored very easily and medicine is a way to keep things interesting. Uh, we've had to change a lot and adjust a lot, especially with COVID, telemedicine, EMR systems. How, how would you... Um, kind of summarize how things have changed since you started practicing. What are the biggest things that stand out to you? Such a great question. And uh, for, like it or not, I have the perspective of over three decades of actually practicing. And um, boy, things have changed. So when I first went to Memphis, first of all, community oncology was in its earliest, earliest days. Um, in fact, when I was at a fellow, there were still people, I didn't really get to interact with them, but there were people like Joe Birchenow, you know, one of the people who invented oncology, who were still there in the building. And Barney Clarkson, who um, was actually chairman of the department there. You know, people from the 50s and 60s who, who were still there, who really started oncology. But of course, oncology in the 60s and 70s was at the academic centers. It was just starting to, I think the fellowship didn't start till about maybe 1980 or so, uh, that you could get board certified in medical oncology. Of course, hematology has a much longer history. So um, we were in the 80s, uh, Bill West was actually the second oncologist in the town. And he was at the university briefly and then left to form a private practice with a research lab. And I thought, wow, this is really, you know, this is really cool. So Early on in my career, we were the, inventing stuff, just like, well, we still are. I mean, uh, oncologists are extremely resourceful. Uh, we're very innovative. Our oncologists are uh, people who are data-driven. And so, you know, over the years, a lot of things have changed. Like, we used to have all our chemotherapy 
in the hospital restaurant. We admitted patients for 5-FU, you know? I mean, that's how it was done. Um, I, I, another interesting story from the early days at Sloan Kettering was uh, most of the work on um, the 5-HT3 receptor antagonists and on Dancitron in particular, the first one that got approved, was done in, uh, in uh, Sloan Kettering and a couple of other places. So I remember very distinctly the pre-antiemetic days. And there was only one solid tumor we could cure in those days, and that was testicular cancer. And, and of course, many years later, it's still a, a cancer that we can cure the vast majority of, right? And so it really had a distinction because of the development of cisplatin. And I came just at the time that cisplatin started. And we gave that the drug, combination chemotherapy, to young men who had testicular cancer. And they came back after one cycle and said, I'm not taking any more. So it was the fellow's job to go into the room and try to convince them that you've got a curable disease, we can really help you, but you've got to take this chemo. And you know, when you're 25, even if you have cancer, you don't really think you're not going to live forever. And uh, it was a tough sell. And they, we basically put them into a coma for five days by just sedating the heck out of them. And that, and they was, it was all, I, it was all inpatient. Of course, that would was inpatient for much longer. But um, so when I was actually there when we first started giving on Dancitron, and uh, it was really incredible. It was like night and day. So that you know, supportive care. Uh, is an important part of cancer care. And actually, one of the areas that I've focused on in my um, research career has been supportive care, like supportive care for antiemetics and uh, several of the newer ones that we're still working on because we still have a little gap uh, in getting no one to have nausea and vomiting. And we're still some way there. I, I'm proud of the fact that we can probably get three quarters of people without any nausea and vomiting now if you give them the right free meds. Um, and then also growth factors. So um, a lot of that w early work, I guess, was an influence for me on, on what I did in my research career going forward. Um, but of course, everything was, was manual then. Um, and uh, some things were easier. Uh, a note could be three lines, Reshma. Yeah. You know, patient doing well, you know, physical exam unchanged. Uh, Impression, you know, stable plan, continue chemo. Uh -huh. you know? See, I'm older than I look. I remember, 10 pages. <laughs> I remember those short notes. Uh, I can't say I remember lack of antiemetics, but I remember admitting a lot more patients in my fellowship for chemotherapy than we do these days. Um, so it sounds like a lot of those early experiences really had a profound influence on you. Yeah, and of course, it was the days before we really didn't understand the biology all that well. Uh, it was interesting. We did a lot of work um, in the 80s, I'm sorry, in the 90s, when I first went to Memphis with high dose chemotherapy. And um, actually, Bill West being the innovator he was, set up a company to do outpatient high dose chemotherapy, which was very controversial at the time. Uh, but we learned how to write SOPs and and to use nurses and to uh, use outpatient facilities so that we could really take care of anyone in the community and give them the highest level of care. And that's really been the motto of my career. Uh, it's what I'm doing now as, as at One Oncology. It's really, I want any patient anywhere to be able to get the care they can get at a University of Miami at a Sloan Kettering at uh, an MD Anderson. And today it's po possible, you know, in the pre-internet days, it was hard to disseminate information. Now it's literally all available immediately. We just had a, a virtual ASCO and mm -hmm. uh, everyone around the world had access to all the slides, to all the presentations right there. So, you know, that old saw about it taking 17 years for new developments to, to, to hit the clinic. I don't really believe it took that long, but it does take some time. And now it should be much more instantaneous. And that, that's really been a huge change, just uh, having the information. Mm -hmm. You know, Lee, when anybody thinks about the impact that someone can make just by 
kind of seeing a need and saying, why, why don't we do it this way? You know, maybe we haven't done it this way for so long. And so maybe that's people's rationale why we can't change to do it in the future. I feel like when you made the decision of leaving, you know, academic medicine at probably one of the strongest institutions in the United States for cancer care and move to a place where you saw that there could be just as much in terms of courage and innovation um, in a setting that looked and felt completely different. Uh, I wonder if that's what started to influence your ability to say, I see that you know community oncology is where the lion's share of patients at least start. Um, and I want to start to change that the course doesn't go, you start in the community and you end in academics because we've got talent, ability, all of the things that we could. I mean, seeing that Dr. West was able to develop so much, maybe even ahead of his time uh, with other things. Here you are now in the mindset of, I can start to influence this. When did you feel like, okay, it's gonna be me. I'm gonna be the one that starts to write the, the future of what community oncology could look like. And I'm gonna partner with people who share the vision uh, and start to develop what that, what that could be. Well, I would say, Sarah, that you never have that, or I didn't have that aha moment. It's gonna be me and I'm gonna do it. It's just, I like I liked to create, I like to innovate. And um, it's always kind of, to me, it's kismet. It's a little bit of, um, you know, you, the luck or how you run into people and how you utilize those things. So I'll give you an example. I think in the early 2000s was really our, um, most creative in various ways of things that came out of w what we were doing at West. So um, I met somebody in the early 2000s um, who was working with a, a company to develop uh, a new type of, of pain medication. Actually, it was, uh, they're, they're off the market now, but it was the first um, fentanyl um, lozenge kind of thing. And I got involved and, and uh, the guy's name was Ted Ocon and we became friends. And uh, uh, after a while, um, we started getting interested in what else can we do? And so what grew out of uh, Ted's interest, he, had, he lived in Connecticut, but he came down to Memphis to work on this project with us uh, from one of the pharmaceutical companies. And he was a, a guy who was also innovative so we started, um, we started a couple of companies. We started a company called Supportive Oncology Services that built the first uh, electronic patient reported outcome system. Um, and uh, we started a research network, ACORN, which was a separate company. We merged them together after a few years. And uh, along with, with Kurt and, and others, uh, we were all partners. We brought in Barry Fortner who was a PhD at the University of Memphis, and then went up to, to uh, Chicago to get postdoc training in oncology and came back, and that was the nucleus of those companies. Um, Ted Ocon, you may know is, and I'll get to that in a second, we also started uh, a, an organization called COA, started in my office, uh, with us thinking that we didn't have representation of uh, community oncology. You know, we had ASCO. ASCO at that time was actually not that interested in the community. It was focused on science and academia. It was sort of be before it became multidisciplinary. And we didn't have a voice um, at wa in Washington in particular. And something called the Medicare Modernization Act was happening. And we wanted to be there and, and understand what was, you know, to explain to Congress what was going on. So uh, Ted Ocon is today the, the remains the uh, the head of the Community Oncology Alliance, which has grown into a very strong and very influential um, organization. And you know we started with a few members, and uh, the last meeting in person last year had uh, you know about three thousand people there, and all every you know every representation. So it's quite influential. Um, SOS and ACORN started 
a community oncology research network, and uh, that was very successful in its time bring, linking together community oncology um, researchers who had trained in the big centers and wanted to do high quality research with and uh, not have it necessarily uh, only at the academic centers where some patients could find it, but really the, where the patients are, meeting the patients where they live kind of thing. And uh, the patient reported outcome system we developed became a template for uh, ones that were developed uh, later on and um, including some of the work uh, that was done at Memorial later um, with Ethan Bash and so forth. He spent a week down with us learning the system. Mark Chris sent him down when he was a fellow saying, hey, these guys are doing something interesting with PROs. But I will tell you that we were, we were ahead of our time. We When we got these tablets, it was before iPads, but they were these dedicated tablets called, made by a company called Motion Computing that had styluses that could write on them. And it was the first tablets, but there was no, it, there was no Wi-Fi. So we actually installed, I remember installing the little antennas in West and people were asking like, what is that? Oh, it's something called Wi-Fi. So we can, we can use it uh, to, to get your responses on your, on your iPads. And uh, so, you know, you never know what, what you're going to do. Like, it feels like you had a career that's a bit like Forrest Gump. You were always there. When, <laughs> that everything important, <laughs> you see Lee Schwartzberg uh, yeah. right there. Um, it's really a few things, anyway. Yeah. Here all things. Those, you know, one thing that, that I'd love to hear, because as you mentioned, we, we uh, meet every week, now every other week, and, and our um, conference calls for practice updates this uh, online platform that has such a wide reach to so many oncologists. Um, this this presence that you've had in medical education and you've reached so many oncologists. T talk to us a bit about how that started. What led you to to go down that route when you've had your hand in so many things? Yeah. So that um, that is maybe an interesting story too. So we had uh, we had started COA and. Um, Somebody wrote an email saying they wanted to use the website communityoncology.com or and .org, I think. And um, we had that website. So we said, well, why do you want to use it? And uh, it, was, um, it was a guy who wanted to start a journal called Community Oncology. So I, I met with him and I said, oh, this is a great idea. So. We launched the journal together, and uh, it, it was um, published for about 10 years. And then uh, over time, it was bought by Elsevier, the largest publisher, who, as you know, publishes uh, Practice Update, uh, and there was their website. Elsevier was in the book business, but they saw this thing called the internet, and they, they're kind of a conservative company. They said, well, you know, maybe this thing is going to stay around. Maybe we should do something on the internet. So their first internet product was uh, a little website that we did um, called um, uh, Oncology Stat. And they, we nursed it for a few years, the same concept, Rishma, that we are doing now we, with multiple channels, but it was just oncology. We would curate um, articles every week from the medical literature and then write little commentaries and also highlight what the important articles were and we would get commentaries from academics and we did some point counterpoints, much like some of the work that Sarah does now so well uh, with her medical education. And so over time, after about five years of, of oncology stat, it started making a little bit of money for Elsevier. And by that time, they kind of figured that this internet's not just a passing phase, it's gonna hang around for a while. So they actually expanded it and it became practice update and they have multiple channels now including um, uh, cardiology and neurology, dermatology, ophthalmology, the same format, they get experts. And uh, I was able to recruit a couple of my friends to be on the main, main channel or the oncology channel, uh, Axel Grothy, uh, who I had invited down to Memphis, I didn't know before, we became fast friends. Um, and, um, uh, Isabel Cunningham, who was a hematologist at Sloan Kettering. So we became the editors of that. And then when we had the opportunity to launch the uh, metastatic breast cancer channel, we did that. And I'm so glad you're involved in that. 
and have Thank been <laughs> outstanding in that run. Thank you. So it's just, again, I feel like there's, you know, as Reshma says, you were there when all of these things at these pivotal moments, but I, I continue to believe, especially because I've over the years come to know you and really love the way you think and strategize and you see things before they're very clear and evident. And I, I love that what you do is kind of empower the people around you to take the opportunity to explore what those things could turn into. And I feel like that's been a common thread and even the stories that you've told in this program, but it's what makes you not just so powerful as someone stand alone as a visionary, but people are attracted to, um, you know, giving themselves, I know I've come to you so many times saying, Lee, what do you think about this? Or Lee, do you think this has legs? Or, yeah. and it, it's so wonderful to have someone who you can kind of use as a sounding board, but who also will care enough to say, well, consider it this way, or I don't think that would work, or, um, you know, it's been tried before, and so uh, try to avoid these pitfalls. So I, I think I can speak for Reshma too, because I'm sure you mentor the people around you clinically the same way and help them grow. But it really, I feel like, um, you know, you're not just there when it happens. You're such a catalyst for things happening. And I think that that's so unique because especially when, you know, doctors in oncology are so focused on solving the big problems that, you know, pop up in everyday clinic, uh, there's not a lot of leftover for energy in looking at, you know, the bigger picture. Uh, so this certainly, you know, spending this time with you tonight certainly just solidifies everything that I think the listeners want to know, which is, you know, how do you balance being this innovator with being this great um, clinician? So I do on behalf of everyone that you've mentored and you've empowered over the years, want to just say thank you for that, because a lot of what we see in oncology today is either rooted in you or you were in the room uh, when it happened. But I do want to get a little bit personal uh, in terms of your love for music. Yeah. I discovered this um, quite by accident. Uh, I worked with a company that the medical director, uh, the company is Agendia, and the medical director is Dr. Ade. And I was talking about Lee Schwartzberg, Lee Schwartzberg, and he said, oh, I know Lee Schwartzberg. I play in a band with Lee Schwartzberg for, during ASCO called the Oncotones. And I was like, Lee Schwartzberg in a band. <laughs> but then I, I realized, yes, it's true. And I got the opportunity to see you all uh, play one year. Tell us about how you started your love for music and where that's kind of led you in, uh, in the things that you've done. Uh, well, I'm I'm really I, I, I'm a little nonplussed that you're surprised because I look like a rock star. So I mean, why couldn't you think that I am one? Yeah, uh, so. <laughs> like Axl Rose. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, no, that's usually the uh, <laughs> they're like, what you play in a band? <laughs> so uh, uh, anyway, when I was a kid, I I loved music from the time I was a kid and. Like um, so many others, when I was uh, probably 11 or 12, my life changed. And there are hundreds of thousands of people tell the same story of my vintage. That in 1964, you turned on, we had one TV set. You turned on the TV set for the Ed Sullivan Show every week, every Sunday night. And there was this band, The Beatles. And when the Beatles came on Ed Sullivan, it's kind of hard to believe today because like Resh was talking about what's different 30 years ago. Well, you know, there were only three channels and everybody watched the same thing. You know, you didn't have a zillion things and everything was so centralized. And, but overnight it was like, uh, I was into music for a couple of years before that. I listened to the radio before I went to sleep and I really loved it. And, but when the Beatles came on, like, um, like everyone else, I just like, oh, this is great. So everybody of my vintage and a little older went out and either bought a guitar or whatever. I had been taking piano lessons, classical piano lessons for about three or four years at that point. 
I didn't love classical piano, but like my other friends, uh, you found some buddies and you formed a band, you formed a group. And so in high school, I, um, I had a band and we used to play little gigs and stuff. And then when I went to college, I had, um, uh, I, I didn't play that much, but I, I, we had a band for a while. And then in, in uh, medical school, I had a band and uh, in uh, which, and then in, um, we actually had a band in Sloan Kettering. Uh, which was called, uh, if you remember there was a band in the 80s called the B-52s. So the leuke leukemia protocol at Memorial was the L-17. So we became the L-17s. That was the ALL protocol that was used for years there. So we were the L-17s. Actually, it's a pretty good band. So we played uh, liver rounds every week, which were Friday afternoon, we'd get some beer and some they get some food and the entire staff would come. And we would play a couple of times a month, you know, for the, for that. So I've I've had a band all along. When I moved to Memphis, actually, one of the things that really kept me sane when I moved to Memphis is that uh, uh, I fell in with a group of um, w one of them's a doctor, but most of them weren't um, of of people that you know played like to play music, and we started um, playing and gigging, uh, you know, so we'd play at bars on weekends, um, not a lot, but you know, uh, maybe once every month or two, we'd play a weekend gig and um, you know, did classic rock and all that. So I've always had this love of doing it. And I just love listening to music and music is so important in my life. It's, uh, it's so great to play music with people, any walk of life, any age, when you're playing and it's, you get into the groove and you're, listening and playing with each other there's nothing like it it's it's a bond it's it's really like a human bond you know you just yeah you you're just there and it transcends everything else it's really incredible so when uh, listening to music can be that way making it and having other people respond to it is even better so uh that's that's really a, a great very very important part of my life and so i'll tell you the story about how we got to asco so um, one, I, I was at dinner with these people from Amgen. This was back in around 2001 or 2002. I think it was 2002 uh, or maybe late one. Anyway, um, and I met this guy, Joe Turgeon, who was the national sales person for Amgen. And he started telling stories and uh, Joe's a, a larger than life personality. And he started telling stories and I'm thinking, this guy is full of it. I mean, he's telling stories. He played for the New York Mets, and then he, with, which he did, he, he played, got up there, you know, for a day at least. And he, uh, but, you know, he was very accomplished. And he goes, oh, yeah, and I play in a band. And we played, um, I used to work in hepatology. We had a band, and uh, we used to get the, uh, the hepatologist to play at, at the national meeting. So interesting, I was actually thinking about this with one of my colleagues from Sloan Kettering who was in the L-17. We had been talking about, wouldn't it be great to get like a house band and we could get oncologists, because we knew there were a lot of oncologists who played, get them up there at ASCO. So um, we had had a little wine. So uh, I said, um, Joe, let me call your boss and see if he would do the same thing that he did when we were in hepatology for oncology. So I called him. And he didn't answer right away, but I left a long, probably rambling message at dinner. And a few days later, he called me back and he said, um, that sounds like a good idea. I think we'll do that. This was before a lot of corporate compliance kind of went on. But uh, uh, Amgen sponsored the band. We had um, about three or four people who were from Amgen. Um, we had uh, a couple of doctors. Um, uh, Bill was one of them who, who early on played with us. Um, we had Bruce Chesson play with us, uh, who loves to play music as well. And uh, my friend from Memorial and a couple of other uh, friends of mine that would come up and rotate on the band. So we started in 2002 at the House of Blues, and it was a benefit. So, um, you know, everybody, all the money that was that was collected there and, and the companies donated to different charities over the years. And we played uh, pretty much continuously through 
about 2011 or so. So we played every year on Sunday night at ASCO. We had great crowds that uh, came and uh, different doctors who rotated through it. And But I was the permanent doctor in the band. So we... We had some great musicians. I played with a lot of really, really talented musicians. We had a few ringers, uh, professionals, uh, one of which uh, was my friend Breeze, who was from uh, from New Orleans when we played. Wasco was in New Orleans one year, and we found Breeze through the promoters. And um, he lived, it was just a fabulous guy, became a close friend. And he was caught in Katrina, came through Memphis on a riverboat he was playing. And loved it so much, he moved his family up here, and uh, he lives in Memphis today and plays music all around the area and teaches. And um, so he became a Memphian as uh, part of the uh, being part of the of our band, which is the Oncotones. So um, a fitting name for an ASCO band. And we also did some gigs during the years. Uh, so uh, we played. We we revi we um, uh, revitalized the band three years ago. So we played the last three years at ASCO. So we were really disappointed we couldn't play this year, but it was great. And for the last three years, we raised money for Komen. And uh, we're proud to say we raised, uh, and we had different sponsorship, um, uh, not for non-pharmaceutical. Um, so we have actually an anonymous, uh, uh, a gentleman who wants to be anonymous, who uh, helped us raise money. So we're able to raise uh, over $50,000 each year for Komen, as well as have people let off a little steam at yeah. ASCO. And uh, we, we play, you know, it's Chicago, so the union makes you turn off the light at midnight sharp. But we, we would play from about 8.30 to midnight. So it was, uh, it was uh, it's a Definitely. challenge for me and my advanced <laughs> age to do that during ASCO. <laughs> a different flavor to ASCO, and it was, it was such, a, such a cool thing. Um, Hopefully we'll bring it back next year. We'll see. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So Lee, you know, one of the things that um, I, I'm sure you've had a lot of mentors over the years, a lot of uh, students and fellows that you've mentored and, and learned from. If, uh, if, if you think back on, on, your, on your career in terms of patients uh, and cases, is there, is there a, a case that stands out to you that you could share with us? Yeah, sure. I, I um... I have a couple of, of cases that uh, were very close to me for, for a variety of reasons. Um, I have, uh, and I, I think the one, the people that became close to me are, um, I'm sure you have the same experience, are the ones that really stand out in your mind. You can't get close to every patient. It would just be uh, too difficult. And there, there's a, a natural place that you're a acting as a doctor, but occasionally um, a patient touches you or just has a relationship with you. So I, um, I do, of course, for the last 10 or 15 years, I've really focused on breast cancer, and my major research focus has been breast cancer. So uh, the large majority of my patients have been breast cancer. So I had um, a patient, a young woman, who came in now about uh, maybe seven, eight years ago, and she had a stage two cancer that was ERPR positive and um, at those it was called her to negative then and she um, we gave her I, I think we gave her TC but um, she had this incredible reaction Reshma um, with like almost uh, she got it peripherally and she had this huge reaction in her arm I thought she might actually lose her arm or have to have debridement. It was really terrible. I'd never seen anything like it. And I was really nervous about that and uh, had to, to work to get through that. It actually it went away completely after a while and she got through it. But because of that, I think even early on, she became uh, a patient that I got very close to because I, I just felt like this was an unusual complication. Unfortunately, she relapsed about two or three years later. And uh, when she relapsed, she was HER2 positive. We went back and tested the original tissue and sent it out for some, you know, some of the special tests. And it was probably borderline, but it was called negative when we had looked at it before. In any event, we put her on HER2 therapy and she did extremely well for, for the first uh, few years. She just had a fabulous response and was in remission 
with uh, a variety of you know, standard HER2 therapies. And um, she uh, also had a BRCA mutation. So we were able to um, later give her uh, a Laparib where we got a response for, for her. And uh, we actually did that with anti-HER2 therapy, which you know at the time was not approved, but she actually had a nice response to that. She, um, she was just um, a, a kind of one of these people who light up the room when, when you meet her. So she started a foundation because she was BRCA positive. She actually started before she relapsed called the Pink Wig Foundation. And she wanted to raise money for genetic awareness and for uh, genetic testing. And uh, she had asked me when she first started this, would I come and speak at her events, which I did. And uh, they got bigger and bigger and her whole family uh, participated in it. Um, she had a great husband who, um, who was working with her on this. And so we became very close. And then of course she relapsed. So we kept taking care of her. Uh, after about, um, you know, we ran out of options and that's when we tried um, CARP inhibitors, which worked for a while. But through this all, she continued to work. She continued to be a fabulous mother. It, she was just such an inspiration to, to everyone. She continued to run her charity events. And um, I'll just, you know, she, she lived about four years. Uh, she, hasn't, she didn't get to see the newer drugs. Uh, there's a lot of complications in the, her disease status. It was very interesting. Well, I won't, we won't get into the medical piece, but actually her phenotypes changed and there were probably two phenotypes going on there and we, where some lesions responded and some didn't actually. And we were able, you know, we did biopsies and when liquid biopsies came in, we were able to do that. She passed away about, um, say about 18 months ago or, uh, or so. And, uh, but she was running, she was like, she would come in she said, oh, I went for a run. I was only able to run seven miles today. And when she was on the PARP inhibitor, I would get her CBC and her hemoglobin was seven, you know, and it had been 11, you know, so she was that kind of person who could just, you know, would just keep going and had an incredibly positive attitude. So that's one patient that um, she taught me so much about human spirit, about giving back. Um, she was just a true light in the world. Yeah, that, that's really, you know, as, as I was talking about influences, you know, as mentors influence us, patients sometimes are so influential, they stick with us uh, experiences in terms of their spirit or some clinical pearl. Uh, so uh, yeah, we all have patients like that. And, and I'm sorry to hear um, that she passed. Uh, in terms of clinical developments, I, I know you've done a lot of work in supportive oncology and, and you spoke about that earlier. Um, if you had to pick a few clinical developments that you were involved with that you really um, are very proud to say that you were part of, um, what yeah, sure. Um, so the uh, it's uh, just uh, in retrospect that early work that when I first came to the clinic that we did in immunotherapy before immunotherapy was really understood and before checkpoint inhibitors sort of set the stage for what came later and. We did see long-term remissions to IL-2. We continued to develop that, and I did a lot of that work. Um, and we actually still have one patient who, believe it or not, came in um, when I first got to M Memphis and we're giving this high-dose IL-2. It was a, a renal cell, he, and his, his lungs were whited out. He came in in a wheelchair from New York because they weren't doing it in New York then. So he actually came from New York to Memphis. And uh, we gave him the infusion and the lac cells, and he, he left, and we didn't think we'd see him again because this guy was on oxygen. And, you know, um, three weeks later, he comes back for his next infusion walking down the hall in the hospital. And he is still in remission 30 wow. years later uh, for that. He's had some other, other medical problems, but he would still come down and see us every year until recently. You know, it made us feel good just mm -hmm. to see. Uh, so the, uh, the, our early work in um, immunotherapy, obviously, is very different now, but it, it, it did set the stage. In breast cancer, um, it was very interesting. I, uh, I was the head of a CCOP that we launched with the, 
with the um, hospital in the late 90s, and we had access to a number of trials. And the two trials that stood out in my mind, and I think this is important, I always try to tell the fellows this, because you know when it's there, just like supportive care, like no one thinks about antiemetics today because they work and it's mundane. Well, it really isn't if you've never had it. Uh, so the same thing was true with a, um, two drugs called Receptin and Rituxin. So in the late 90s, uh, the, the Rituxin phase three trial launched, and it's a little known story that that study was originally AC plus um, trastuzumab for patients that were HER2 two plus or three plus by IHC. So it was selected, but it wasn't you know, perfect selection. And the trouble, the, the study was almost ready to close because people were aghast at using a monoclonal antibody. What do you mean? Why would we use a monoclonal antibody? We have chemotherapy. And you know, how does this thing work? It's not gonna work. Um, so because it was accruing so slowly, they added the paclitaxelon, which at that time was just coming up and starting to, to plant AC. And when they did that, they uh, were able to finally accrue the study. If you go back and, re and read Dennis Slayman's original paper, you'll see that um, really, if you just look at the AC cohort, it was hard to see the response. It was really the taxol that drove it. And um, uh, that study not only would have closed, but it might've been negative if it had been AC alone because it wasn't so exclusive. So we put patients on, it was a randomized trial. And, uh, but I'm proud that we were part of the phase three study and we were able to put patients on that trial. The rituxin study was a large phase two trial of single agent rituxin in uh, relapsed um, lymphomas, which was part of the CCOP. And I personally, in those days, I was doing a lot of heme malignancies and I put four patients on and I could not believe my eyes. I mean, here we had chemo, they had been three, three or four, giving this monoclonal antibody against CD20, all four patients responded and it just melted away to single agent rituxin. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, this is gonna be a great drug. So um, I look back on those things as uh, really, really uh, incredible opportunities. And then in directing the research department for many years at uh, West, uh, we've seen, a, you know, we've been involved in the development of, of a lot of drugs. We, we were part of the ipilimumab uh, phase two and three studies. So we, we saw responses in melanoma there in the early days of checkpoint inhibitors. And of course, um, uh, some of the precision medicines uh, we were involved in. Um, another thing, when we had ACORN, I'm proud of the fact that Lilly had a trial with this drug, Pemetrexid, that they were looking at to look, use in maintenance therapy. Trial was not accru accruing. I mean, now everyone takes for granted, you know, how you give pemetrexid. Um, that study was really tough. They came to ACORN and said, would you champion this trial in your sites? And we did. We put a lot of patients on it. Of course, it was positive and it showed histologic uh, preference. And so, you know, I, my lesson from all that is, you know, keep an open mind because, um, I mean, drug development has changed. So if you ask what changed, I think drug development has changed so d dramatically. Phase one studies were last ditch efforts for safety. And so it's not the same today. We know the biology better, but you know, keeping an open mind for a new type of agent is uh, really worthwhile. I think that's really important. Well, Lee, we're coming down to our last few minutes of the podcast and I'm going to kind of ask for it to be a little bit of a lightning round. I have three questions for you. Um, okay. You know, we, we all three months ago, which sometimes feels like three years ago, started to change our life. No more travel, no more, you know, just spontaneous. Can you go speak here? Can you go to a meeting there? Um, when all of these lift and when we're back to moving around uh, and exploring the world, where would you like to go first? Oh, well, um, we were supposed to take a trip to Paris. So that's number one on my list. Uh, I had that at vacation plans in April. Um, so um, I wanna go there for sure. Okay. 
Very good. What, since you love music, what is your most memorable concert? Oh, uh, that's a tough one. Um, you know, my favorite bands, I saw so many in the 70s and 80s. Uh, it's probably a toss up um, between Led Zeppelin and The Who at their peak years uh, when it was incredible. It really was. Very cool. And then my final question for you is, what's something about Lee Schwartzberg that most people don't know? Um, well, uh, I'm a collector. I'm gonna show, I'm gonna just swing the screen around there. You see that blue? Yeah. See that? Okay, that's every issue oh. of Journal of, of Clinical Oncology because my career as a fellow started coincident with the publication of JCL. So yes, I still collect paper and uh, I have all that paper here, even though of course I read it online. So I have uh, a <laughs> continuous full version of JCL here. If anybody wants to buy it from me, I'll okay. <laughs> That's definitely something very cool. And I love that it coincided, you know, it wasn't something that kind of you planned ahead. It was something that coincided with, uh, with your career and you thought to do that. So that's fantastic. Well, I thank you. You know, I promised that this would go fast. It always goes too fast. I'm sure Rachel and I each could fill another hour with questions for you, but I do appreciate, you know, one of the reasons why we built this podcast is because we wanted to bring, you know, bright news, good news, get, create that human connection again, now that we've kind of largely gone virtual. Um, but this really endures because you have people at all ages and stages, people that you kind of came up with, uh, right. people that you currently work with, and then in the future, uh, people that will come to know more about you through this time that you spent with us. So I, I, really enjoyed our time together. We got to learn much more about you than, you know, your podium presence, uh, which is so significant to start with. And I thank you for not just your time with us tonight, but all the things you're doing. I look forward to seeing uh, what's next and how you continue to innovate both at West and at One, uh, how you continue to champion community oncology, you know, elevating it. Uh, so that patients, you, you reach patients right where they are, like you said. And I just joined with Reshma in saying thank you for spending the time with us tonight. And we look forward to the time we can see each other in person. Always Absolutely. A yeah, it's my privilege to be with both of you. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks for allowing me to share. And it's just so much fun to share this with our friends and with our colleagues. So. I very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great evening. You too.